I would like to introduce you to Minister Frances Fitzgerald. Um, it's a true honour for us to have her here. She is the minister whose remit really governs the courses that you are all going to be doing, the career areas that you want to get involved in. Um, this is the person who is going to be sort of shepherding your careers forward into the future. So she has very graciously agreed to come here, um, have a very quick chat with me, and then she's going to be answering your questions, which I know we have talked a great deal about uh, putting together and making sure that you're asking the things that you're really interested in. So please give a very warm round of applause to uh, Minister Fitzgerald. Minister, uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, one of the things that has interested the group very much um, as we've been researching yourself and what you do is the fact that you come from a, 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 a very much a, a sort of social care background yourself. Could you, would you mind maybe just sharing with us a little bit about when, when you were, I suppose maybe a, a teenager yourself, what it was that prompted you to go in that direction in terms of your career? Um, well, my father was involved with a charitable organisation, a voluntary organisation. He was in the army, but he was involved in a voluntary capacity in the Polio Fellowship of Ireland. And I remember when I was about 13 or 14, he was doing a survey in a county, County Kildare, of families who'd been affected by polio. And I remember going out and just being with him in the car, literally, and he was going into families, meeting them and uh, getting information from them and you know, trying to survey precisely how uh, young people had been affected by polio. And I suppose when I look back, I think that was quite important because it just gave me a feel of you know, a social and health issue and his interest as a, as a volunteer. And he was involved in a lot of other voluntary um, groups as well, Citizens Advice Bureau in a voluntary capacity. And I think that was probably the first you know, sort of seed of interest in, in the social work in the broad sense area. And then when I was in secondary school, I decided I'd like to do social science. Um, just a general interest, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in issues and I like meeting people and I was interested in social problems and I did a social science degree then in UCD. And I really enjoyed that and it has stood to me, uh, you know, throughout my career really. I never ever thought I'd be in politics. I never had any plan to be in politics. Uh, it wasn't any part of a grand plan to become minister or even a TD at that time. So I, I did a basic social science degree and I, I really loved it. When you, when you started out on the road of, of social work, I mean, do you remember your first, your first job? Where, where was your first gig as a social worker? Well, I suppose like a lot of the students here, I did, I did uh, placements during the course of my, uh, my, uh, my training. Um, I remember going over a very bumpy bridge in Kilkenny with a social work uh, supervisor who was working with the National Rehabilitation Board, NRB. Now it's gone into something else, the, I think the National Disability Authority. And that was going to meet uh, young men and women who had a, a physical disability and looking at their employment needs. So that's a, an early memory of, of social work. And I worked, um, I worked in St. James's Hospital with, the, with elderly who needed uh, placement, who needed support, who needed uh, home care packages. They weren't called that then, you know, who needed home health. And uh, that was very pivotal as well in terms of just remembering, you know, the needs of that group at that time. And that's a long time ago. And then um, I did other placements. I did some research as well. And then uh, my first job was in a very small children's hospital in Dublin. Uh, I was the only social worker there. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked there, and there was a lot of children at that time. That was in the 70s. There were a lot of children who had actually been abandoned by their families, and they were quite institutionalized. And I did a lot of work with the pediatricians. There were very good pediatricians there, um, looking at attachment issues, trying to reunite those children. And if they couldn't be reunited, some very young babies, uh, trying to see how their needs could be met. So that, was the, that was the beginning. It's interesting that you mentioned attachment. We were just looking at Bowlby this morning, yes. actually, some of the, with some of the groups. Um, my groups, my students were also fascinated by the fact that you were for want of a better term, a professional feminist. Yes. For some time you're involved in the National Women's yes. Council now. I mean, we spend a long time in the courses looking at the impact that feminism and yes. gender studies has had on sort of the development of Ireland as a society. 
What, what brought you to that area of work? Well, I think it was probably reading and just seeing what was happening around me, seeing the inequality in the law for women at that time and the huge change that was needed. I've always been amazed at the lack of representation of women in politics, for example. It's still dreadful. It's still only, you know, 15%. Um, and I just sort of, feminism makes total sense to me. And uh, I just see it as a, a very <coughs> proud word, a very good word. Um, kind of interested that maybe younger women, younger men probably don't maybe see it in the same way as I did at my time, because it just seemed uh, obvious that the goals of feminism needed to be met, and I still feel the very same. Is there a particular school of feminist thought you would ally yourself Not to? Not particularly. I mean, I think I'm very mainstream about it. Mm. You know, I see it in a very general way around equality. I think it's just linked to equality of all human beings, you know. Um, I, I'm very driven by equality. I think, I think oh, my family weren't very political. As I say, my father was in the army, but, uh, and so, you know, there was kind of a, a divide around politics. But, I think there was a strong sense of social justice, and I've always hated injustice, um, you know, and I've always felt equal opportunity is just so important, and, you know, I'm very committed to how people's lives can be changed if they get the right opportunity. Even when I worked in London, say, in child, with uh, one of the world's experts, he always said to me, you know, if you can give a child um, a success experience, and I think it's the same for all of us, if you can give people a success experience and break the cycle of, you know, having a hard time, if you like, it makes such a difference to people. And whether that's educational or personal, I, I really believe that if you can interrupt the cycle of, of disadvantage or inequality, you're changing people's lives. So that would have been, that's very fundamental to me. And I think feminism is part of that. But on the more general scale, I really do believe we need to work towards a more equal society where people have more opportunity. And we have a lot of divisions, even still in Ireland. You've said that you never saw yourself getting involved in politics. That was never part of your long-term yes. game plan. What changed? <laughs> well, um, I worked. I lived in London for six years, and I worked as a social worker in Lewisham Social Services and Southwark. And then I trained as a family therapist. And um, so I was working a lot in a whole variety of settings with the young people who left school. Um, I was doing intermediate treatment programs, as they were called at the time, uh, doing uh, group work with young people who couldn't cope with uh, the schooling situation or were getting into trouble with the law. And then I, I, came, back, I came back to Ireland and um, I got involved with an organisation called the Women's Political Association and then with the National Women's Council. And when I was in London, I'd been involved with a group. Um, I, I met some people earlier here who, who were doing working in, in the childcare area, and we talked about mother and uh, toddler groups. Yes. I, had, I became involved in setting up one of those when my first son was born. I have three, I have three uh, sons, and uh, I got kind of more interested in, in, in the whole, you know, who makes decisions in Ireland, really. And I became chair of the National Women's Council. At that time, it was an organisation of about 80 different women's organisations working on a whole range of issues. The ICA, domestic violence, lone parents, all the different issues. And then I started lobbying government ministers and I began to see how politics work, how government works. And I just got more and more involved as chairwoman of that organisation. And I, I did that for four years and I did a lot of media. And uh, I was actually asked to become involved in politics and I was finishing up that work. It was voluntary and uh, I gave it a go. And I got elected very quickly after a three-week campaign. And it was downhill after that. I <laughs> lost several elections and won several elections and recently uh, got elected to the Senate. And I was leader in the Senate of um, the Fine Gael group. And then luckily, I got elected on the last occasion and, and was asked to be minister. So I've had, mm -hmm. a, I've had a career that's, um, I think political careers are always very uh, checkered, really. And uh, so uh, this, that's how I ended up in politics. A very good friend of mine um, who was uh, heavily involved in politics said to me when I was chatting to him about the fact that I was going to be meeting you, said that um, he felt that your, your personal politics is much more towards kind of the humanistic or towards the left than would f maybe fit the public perception of what Fine Gael is often about. How do you feel about that? Well, it's an interesting comment, but when I think about Fine Gael, I think of Fine Gael. You know, I joined Fine Gael 
uh, when Gareth Fitzgerald was leader. I think of Fine Gael as the Just Society. Um, I think Fine Gael is a broad church. I feel very comfortable in Fine Gael. And of course, now we're in, we're in government with Labour. So, um, I, no, I feel very comfortable in, in, in Fine Gael politics, but I'm probably more, um, I would say I probably am more to, to, to the left than you know, some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. definitely, yes. There's, it's, it's been a busy time for you of late. There's been a, a lot of um, stories in the media, particularly I was reading the newspapers and listening to the media over the weekend, and I was amazed at how often you actually uh, popped up in one, everything from <laughs> Operation Transformation to, uh, to, 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 to the Sunday um, sort of insert in, in the Independent. Um, just, I just want to touch on a couple of stories mm -hmm. that you seem to have been very involved in. And again, both of them are, are issues that the students would have been chatting about in class over the last little while. One of them that is particularly of interest to me is the whole issue of very evocative clothes for very young children in, in some of the, sort of the mainstream outlets. And I know that this is something you've taken a very strong stand on. Could you chat to us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, childhood is, a, is an important space. I think it's... Um, without being over traditionalist about it. I think it's really important that we allow children to be children, that we have that space. And I think we have to be sensitive to the kind of commercial pressures that can, you know, if you like, intrude in that space inappropriately. I was very interested to see in the UK that they had brought out a very interesting code of practice for the retailers um, about marketing to very young children and that a lot of the clothing um, was getting, tending to be very sexualized and uh, inappropriate really for younger children. Um, now you could say it's the state being in any state, but I don't agree with that. I think it's actually um, absolutely right for the state to say with the retailers, let's have a code of practice around this. So I asked Retail Ireland, would they work out a code of practice similar to what's been done in England on a voluntary basis? And uh, they've agreed to do that, so I'm really pleased. So the story I think of the weekend was that the big retailers here have agreed to a code of practice you know, covering how you market to, say, eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds, uh, what kind of clothing, um, you know, just the whole, the whole sort of space around that. And I Have think you it's had an any, interesting any one. backlash from parents at all? No, in fact, I mean, both young people, I mean, the studies we have about young people are saying they are concerned about body image. Um, parents are generally saying to me that they support it. I've had very little. I mean, I suppose you do get some commentators who say, well, is it really the role of the state to be saying anything? Is this not parental choice? But I, I feel it's an appropriate space for the retailers and myself to be involved in, mm -hmm. in terms of a code of practice. And that's what we're getting, a voluntary code of practice. Is childhood getting shorter? I think, think it is. Is that a good thing? Yes. I don't think it is. I mean, I, I think... Uh, what we have, or we have, you know, the kind of communications we have now, you, you have to, I mean, I think one of the really good things about if childhood is getting shorter, what's really important is that children, you know, we listen to the voice of the child, uh, we think about the best interests of the child, that's why I'm having the referendum later this year. Um, we have to educate our children to be able to cope with these various pressures. But I think when you ask that question, it's probably, uh, we have thought of childhood as a fairly protected space, and I think that protection, you know, there's more and more things impacting on it, whether it's sexualized clothing or, you know, mass communications and, you know, new media. Um, I was in Scotland Yard recently and having a discussion about um, internet and internet security for young people. And it was, you know, to hear that many of the images about, of young people which are used in some aspects of the internet that we wouldn't be very happy about are put up by young people themselves. Yeah they get used and abused on it. Absolutely. So, you know, again, it's about information education, I think. And if childhood is getting shorter, we've just got to make sure that our kids know what they're taking on when they're using new technology or, you know, maybe buying very provocative clothing, you know. So I think these are all interesting topics. Another story, I, I heard you being interviewed, I think it was on Radio 1, but I stand to be corrected on that, about the, um, the state of play of the National Children's Hospital. Yes. And I was struck by, by, even though you were speaking in a very controlled tone, I could hear how angry you were about the way things were going. Um, and there's been a, a huge amount of comment over the weekend from various experts and expert groups about what it's going to mean if we don't get this hospital yeah. up and running. Um, where do you think, what do you think the future holds for us in relation to that? Well, it's, uh, as you say, I mean, it's, I'm sure all of you have been reading the, the newspapers on this. Uh, it's been very complex in its, its birth. Yeah. And 
you know, we'll be looking at it at Cabinet, I'm sure, tomorrow and trying to see where to from here. Uh, James Riley has said he'll bring a small group together to just say, you know, where to now. I think we have to look at planning considerations. You know, we have to see how we respond to the inspector's report, which is 100 pages. I haven't read it all yet. I have to read it tonight. I've read the summary. Um, they make very serious points from a planning point of view. From my point of view, it's about how do you get a children's hospital built as quickly as possible that's high quality. Um, we need to have the tertiary care for children, the very specialist care for children. We need to bring it together in the one setting and you know, combine the expertise. Um, we're also told it should be near a, an adult hospital and a maternity hospital. So you know, the options are limited enough, but it's, it's a difficult decision. But you know, what we don't want is we don't want it going on for another five or six years. We want to deliver it in the next few years. Uh, do you, so do you think a, that the, the response that it was going to um, disrupt the city skyline, I mean, do you think that's a valid reason not to build a hospital? Well, you know, personally, I think democracy matters. I think the kind of planning you have matters. I think it should be respected. I do think we have to take note of what was said. Um, you know, it's a question. I'd be interested to know what people here think. I mean, you know, I think it's one consideration. Um, I don't believe in riding roughshod over, you know, what we have set up democratically to make decisions around planning. I think we have to read it, we have to analyse it and decide how we respond to it. I mean, as Minister for Children, of course, my priority is to have um, the, the children's hospital built. If we can do it within the planning guidelines, so much the better. And it's very unfortunate to have arrived at a state where, you know, it's the planning criteria are determining it at this stage. Okay, do we have our roving mic ready to start roving? We do. Okay. Right. The, now, I just want to say, Minister, first of all, that we have a very, very, very nervous group of students here um, who are going to be asking you some questions. So um, I think you're our telling me they're nervous. They are there's, nervous, there's hundreds yeah. hundreds of them. Ah, come on, you're, 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 you're used to this. Um, <laughs> right, so our first speaker is over this side of the room. So Denise... Um, Denise has a question for you, Minister, about kind of marrying your, your, your social work experience with your current role. So, Denise, off you go. Um, do you think that having experience in social care gives you a better understanding as our Minister um, of how the care system in Ireland should be run and to identify where it needs to be improved? So do you think that having experience in social care gives you a better understanding as our minister of how the care system in Ireland should be run and to identify where it needs to be improved? Well, thank you, Denise. Um, I think it does. I mean, I think, you know, the kind of areas that you're all studying um, give you a great insight, as you all know. They give you a great insight into children, into parents, into community. Uh, and I think as minister, my background in social work and social care, I've worked in care settings as well, um, it has informed me, and when I came to put the department together, which I've had to do in the last year, um, what I've done is I've created a new department of children and youth affairs. Um, I've brought together different areas that impact on children's lives, like child protection, adoption, fostering, youth justice, uh, and other areas, uh, education welfare. I've brought those together, and my own experience of working in communities, I worked in Ballymun for 10 years, um, seeing the kind of issues that Ballymun was coping with, um, working with children and families in a, in a clinical setting and in other settings. I did a placement in a, a child care service um, when I was doing my social work. I'm just remembering that in Henrietta Street in Dublin, I remember. So I think all of those experiences come together when you're a minister. And when I'm charged with being a minister for children and youth affairs um, and having to make policy decisions about uh, the early years program, for example, about the ECCE scheme, um, about how parents would be involved in that, about standards and training, and the kind of service uh, that uh, we want to deliver to young people. I think my social work background uh, does help a lot. I'll give you an example. Uh, Shane mentioned Bowlby, John Bowlby, uh, and I've always been very interested in attachment in young children and how we best develop attachment. And if we're going to provide alternative care for children outside of the family, if parents are working, for example, or if they're combining work and family life, it's really important that we remember, you know, the psychological theories about attachment 
uh, that is childcare workers or people working in, in childcare services, that we think about what's in the best interest of the child when it comes to attachment. And how do we therefore need to plan the services? How do we need to train those who work in the services? Um, how do we help them to understand what children's needs are? And my own background studying psychology and social case work and research, um, I think it's been really helpful. I think it's hard when you're made a minister in an area maybe that you've got to get up to speed on immediately. I mean, I have been spokesperson on defense. I've been spokesperson on arts and culture, social welfare. This is what happens in politics. You have to move across uh, different areas. But it's a real privilege for me to be a minister in an area that I have a you know, very particular interest in and that I've done uh, some training in the, on areas that affect the ministry. So it is, I think it's a great background. I think these subjects you're all studying are, you know, they're fantastic for your futures. They certainly were for mine, uh, you know, getting the exposure to psychology, to sociology particularly. Um, that's really helpful in, 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 in politics, I think. Minister, sorry, you, you mentioned the, the fact, of course, that this is the first time that we're really seeing a senior ministry yes. focusing on, on children and, and youth affairs. I mean, you, you've actually built this yes. into what it is from the ground up. I mean, yes. What kind of an experience has that been like? Well, it's been, um, it's been very busy. Have you uh, had support? Very... I mean, has there been an, an, yeah. an interest in getting Well, it? if you want, the other has. I mean, first of all, there's been commitment at government level because you know, to say this is a senior ministry is a big statement by any government because there's only so many ministries. And to actually say, you know, we're going to have a ministry of children and youth affairs, you're taking it away. You know, if you want to look at it one way, you're taking it away from another potential area. But as I say, we have a, we have a minister for, um, you know, trains and boats and planes and land and foreign affairs and all sorts of things. So why not our 1.1 million children? But it's a value statement by government to have that ministry. Uh, and then putting it together, I've had a lot of help uh, from the Taoiseach, from the AG, the Attorney General, because there's a lot of legal issues. When you start to bring a new department together, you have to establish it legally. You have to decide what's going to be in that department. Uh, so there was a junior ministry, so that was a start. And then I had to go to various ministers and negotiate with them, for example, education. Can we bring the education welfare aspects into the department? Can we bring the youth justice, you know, where we're dealing with young people who get into trouble with the law? Can we bring them into, uh, into the department? You know, I want to bring those into the department. And, you know, there are other areas I think we need to think about uh, that should be in the department that just right now aren't. So I see it as developmental. I don't see it as finished now, Shane. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Stephanie is up next. Yeah. Yes, sure. It's too loud, is it? Yeah. Okay. Adjust okay. the sound. Okay. Sorry, Stephanie is up next. Um, Stephanie is over this side as well. And Stephanie has a question about, um, I suppose, what, what, what's the, the, the most important issue that you feel you're dealing with? Off you go, Stephanie. Um, what is the one issue you feel has most personally exercised you as the Minister for Children and why? What is the one issue that you feel has most personally exercised you as the Minister for Children and why? Well, I think there's only one answer to that question and it's the issue of child protection. I think the first job I have to do is insofar as I can and insofar as the government can, make sure that children are safe. I mean, the first goal of a Department of Children and Youth Affairs, uh, given our tortuous history in relation to child protection and the 15 reports that we've had, I think my first job is to ensure uh, that we have a situation where if a child has been abused or neglected or sexually abused, physically abused, um, that something will be done, that people will act, that we won't be silent like we were before, um, that people will take action and that when they take action they'll get a response. Um, that's really the first goal that I would have before anything else. And I would say it's exercised me the most because it might sound simple, but actually making sure around the country that we have the resources, the teams, the response in place is really important. And it's challenging at a time of limited resources, less resources than we had before. And I'm working with other people. Luckily, I don't have to do this myself, but uh, I'm working with Gordon Jays, who's running the, uh, he's the national director for the HSE. Um, I have terrific teams around the country, all of whom who want to do a good job in difficult circumstances. Um, but that is, I would say, the number one goal. And, uh, you know, I saw a child the other day. She was just over a year. 
Um, she had to be weaned off crisps at one year, two months. She was 20% underweight. She was in a childcare facility. They were working with her mother who was drug addicted. That's a challenge. And that's not just in one place in the country. That's around the country. So there are very serious neglect issues, very serious challenges. And as I say, it's not just for me as minister, it's for the entire community uh, that this is a challenge. So you're all part of responding to that challenge, I think. Uh, and it's a very serious one. And you know, the vast majority of Irish children, Irish childhood has changed beyond recognition. It's so much better for the majority of Irish children. We've changed our attitude to physical punishment. We understand child development more. We listen to the voice of the child more. Uh, but we still have, with a minority, very serious problems in relation to child development and child neglect and protecting children. So that's been the big one, and it, that's why I reissued Children First, and we did a booklet for all of the workers around the country to understand how they will implement that. And I'm getting great support on it, I have to say, from, from all of the workers and frontline workers and organisations. Thank you very much. Uh, where's Ashling? There you go. Right behind you there, Frank. Um, Ashling has a question for you, Minister. She has two great questions. I'd love to get her to ask you both of them, but I'm going to follow on from what you've <laughs> just said. She has a question about the Children First guidelines. Yeah. Why were Children First guidelines not immediately put into law? Why were the Children First guidelines not immediately put into law, do you think? Okay. Um, who asked that question? Ashling. Ashling, thank you. Um, it sounds simple sometimes saying, why isn't something put into law? Um, I am working on that. We're putting it into law. We're going to make it statutory, which means putting it into law. Um, I have a lot of people working on that at the moment. Um, it takes time. The intention is to put it into law. But it's interesting. We have this booklet on children first. But to turn it into a law um, that's going to work takes a bit of time and there's a lot of work being done on it. So when you're turning something uh, from a document and policy into law and, and creating legislation, you have to think about all sorts of things. You have to think, for example, with Children First, you have to say, well, what's the definition of an organization? If we say that organizations have to report child abuse or neglect where they're concerned that there may be a problem, um, you have to define every word you use in the legislation and the only reason it hasn't yet been in law is because the background work is taking a fair bit of time. But I hope to have it ready probably in March and going into a committee for a discussion. And legislation goes through different stages. Uh, the first stage is you draw up what's called, this is a technical term, the heads of the bill. You'll be familiar with that from your study. Um, so that's the stage I'm at in the legislation. And we have the policies worked out because they're there in Children First. And now it's a question of getting into the doll, into the committees, into the Senate. And I hope by the end of the year it will be law. And it's been promised for about eight years. And when I went into the department, I found no work had been done on it, none at all. So um, I've had to start getting the legislation prepared. And I'm very impatient. I think you're impatient about, about that, uh, Denise. So am I. I mean, I just want to. It's not Denise, is it? It's Ashling. Ashling. <laughs> I, I'm impatient around it as well. It's, it's sometimes slower than you'd expect, getting legislation ready. And then you have to think about things like sanctions. So if somebody doesn't report, are we going to fine them? Are we going to put them in prison? Uh, you know, what is the appropriate where, level? Where do, you, where do you stand on mandatory reporting? I mean, that that's kind well, of a, almost comes loping after children first. It does. It? Well, yeah. I think, you know, if you mean that it's mandatory at the moment, if you have a concern about a child, if you think a child has been abused or neglected, it's mandatory. You have to, you have to report. Um, and I see the, the Children First guidelines as um, very, I don't call it mandatory reporting, but I say there's an obligation on people to report if they're concerned. Now, what we have to watch is that the services don't get overwhelmed. We have to look at filtering to make sure that the social worker who answers the phone has the authority and is able to ask the right questions and that we don't have to take all, everybody who just gets an idea to, to ring up, you know, or uh, that it's dealt with properly, that people, so that the services aren't overwhelmed. I think that's the main worry about mandatory reporting. Okay, um, Ashling had a second question there, which I would allow, I'm gonna ask it myself, because um, I, 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 I know that this is something that you've spoken on as well in the past. Um, do you think that, you know, we're talking about child protection, do you think the church has done enough 
to make amends for, you, you know, you talked about the terrible past that we have. And the first thing I always say to students when they come in is that, you know, we do not have a proud history of child protection in mm, Ireland. That's right. H has, has the church done enough? I mean, Fine Gael has taken, particularly Enda Kenny, has taken a very strong stance. Well, you know, the church and state have both failed children. That's the first thing I'd, I'd say. Has the church done enough? It needs to be continuously doing more and more. That's the truth, the same as the state. Um, what the church has done recently, which I welcome, it's published the audit of a number of dioceses. Um, the church now needs to publish the rest of the audits of the rest of the diocese. I'm also going to be publishing an audit that the HSE is doing um, on the church. Um, that'll come about May. Um, I think the church has done some very good work with Ian Elliott and the Safeguarding Board um, in terms of standards. I think the church has to be unambiguous about dealing with um, child abuse. Um, I think most of the diocese now would say that the vast majority of people in Ireland now know that we've had a terrible history and, and you know, want to make up for it, want to do the right thing. Um, but I think you know, the nature of child sexual abuse, for example, is that People who are being affected, very often children don't tell, as, as you all know. And, you know, it could be five years, 10 years, 15 years before we know that maybe some children who are currently being abused will talk. So I think, you know, we have to be ever vigilant, both church and state. And uh, the church has put in place now, um, you know, at parish level, uh, groups to, to, to um, be responsible for implementing children first. And I think that's a good thing. So, you know, where there's progress, I'd always welcome it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Kate, where's Kate? Right behind you there, Frank. Um, Kate has a very interesting question on parenting. Go yeah. for it. Um, do you think that Ireland as a society needs to take a closer look at the rights and privileges of fathers in light of some of the recent court battles and not to mention the murder-suicide cases that we seem to be seeing more and more of? Do you think that Ireland as a society needs to take a f another look at the rights and privileges of fathers in light of some of the recent court battles and sort of murder-suicide cases and various things that have come up in recent years? The rights of fathers, is it something yes. we need to look at? I think so. I'm not quite sure how you're thinking about it yourself from the way you've asked the question. Uh, but my own view is that we do need to take a fresh look at, at the rights of fathers. Um, I think we have to look at both parents um, I think we have to look at the rights and responsibilities of both uh, mothers and fathers. I know many men feel that they've got a, a, you know, a, a bad deal when it comes to decisions in the court. I'd like to see court cases being published. You know, I'd love to, if we could have more information uh, about kind of the decisions that are being made. I think we need to be fair to both parents. Um, I think a child needs, for example, I would have the father's name on the birth cert. I would make that a statutory. I think that should happen. I think every child has a right to know their identity. Um, they do that in Sweden and other countries. Um, I think that's really critical. I can't understand, you know, it's, it's something that I know has been looked at. Um, and I do believe that there have been some injustices to fathers. Um, but equally, it is about responsibilities as well. So, uh, you know, we need, we need to support parents wherever we can. I think identity is really important to children. And uh, we've just got to get more real about that in this country. I mean, I, I think if we can provide access, if there is separation uh, for parents, uh, I think parents, we have to try and help parents to take as mature an attitude as they can and try and put the best interests of the child uh, first as opposed to their own needs. We've tried to move away from where there's battles around custody. You know, it's really about the adults fighting with one another as opposed to what's best for the child. And again, I think the referendum will be very helpful on this, Shane. Sure. You know, if, if we try to get into people's minds, what's in the best interest of the child? You know, not that there's a marital problem or an ongoing battle around something. Um, so I think we've worked to do it as a society, really. It, it always puzzles me that when you actually look at the, the textbooks that we use when we're yes. in college, the model of care that we teach people, regardless of their gender, we call it mother care, you know, even yes. the, the, the brand of infant baby food, you know? Yes. Is it possible that we, we tend to forget that, you know, that there's such a thing as a paternal instinct, that fathers can be as bonded, I mean, we've talked about attachment Absolutely. a lot, they can be as bonded to their children yes. as mothers can. Do, we yeah. think, do you think sometimes as a society we forget that, or? Yeah, well, I think we make it too easy sometimes for fathers to opt out as well. I mean, I think we need to look at the lone parent allowance, I think we need to look at, um, you know, how do we ensure that both parents continue to be involved? 
you know, I think some of the, the rules that apply around some of our allowances discourage um, fathers to be around. So, you know, I, I don't think that's a good thing. So, um, I, you know, I very much come from the perspective that we, you know, the, the, from the child's perspective, the child needs to know who, and have as much contact as is reasonable. Now, that's not to deny that there are serious issues, and increasingly, unfortunately, at the moment, around domestic violence and, and uh, violence in the home. These are very real issues. Uh, but nevertheless, I think culturally, we need to think much more about the role of fathers. And obviously, there's been huge changes, although, uh, not enough. I was looking at a study recently on uh, men's involvement in household tasks. There's still a way to go, Shane. <laughs> Not all men. Not all men. <laughs> oh, you got I, me no, no, there. I, I, I was, I was um, I, no, 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 but I, I was looking at some of the studies, and clearly they're showing changes in the roles of, 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 of men and women, but, but still kind of imbalances in yeah, terms of absolutely, who, who absolutely. does a lot of the parenting. Okay, Deirdre. Deirdre Wickham. Yeah. Okay, Deirdre has a question for you about the early years curriculum. I had, but I wanted to change it, if that's okay. Um, I'm one of the teachers here at the college, and um, my question had been about the marrying of the primary school and the uh, early years curriculum as a standard where we had capitation and all the rest of it that we have through mainstream. But when I was listening to you talking to about, you know, children first and the funding and these things, you know, and, and, and child protection, which I feel very strongly about as well. My concerns are that we have had so little funding. We are slicing, you know, uh, social workers, social care workers. In fact, when I was a social care worker in practice, it was often in favor of social workers. So workers like myself who would have got down with the, the families uh, were taken away in favor of social work places. And this was, you know, about, about 12 years ago when there was more money in the country. And we know that social workers are losing their jobs. We know that childcare family support workers are losing their jobs. And on top of that, if we only give um, minimum wage, say, to childcare workers, how can we expect them to be qualified and capable and understand these policies as they come to them? It's a bit convoluted, but um, it's just in reference to what you were saying. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's a big question. I mean, I suppose the whole childcare sector, if you think about it, if you go back, say, 15 years, 20 years, go back 15 years, I, some of the people here from the county childcare committee I met with earlier, the city childcare committee, I should say, um, earlier, who were working professionally in this area, we were talking about the huge changes we've seen um, in terms of a sector, you know, if you like. Um, I remember the sector when it was much more informal and people were really struggling for recognition. I mean, the changes over the last 10 years have been phenomenal in the sector. Now, having said that, I appreciate fully what you're saying about rates of pay, about valuing the, the sector, about the esteem and confidence that the sector has. A lot more money has gone in, um, but there are issues about training, there are issues about wages, um, and I suppose, in a way, it's linked to the undervaluing traditionally of the, the work of childcare. You know, when it was being done quietly and privately behind closed doors, um, way back we had the debates about, you know, should the mother in the home or the parent in the home, you know, have a wage? You know, that was the kind of early discussion. Then it, it got to the point where we're saying, are we going to provide childcare facilities to support people who want to combine work and family life? Then that became accepted when the economy needed. The danger is now when the economy maybe doesn't need work as just as, as many as previously, that again, the sector finds it very difficult. And again, I think I'd go back to my principle about if you say what's in the best interest of, of the child and uh, the kind of services and supports we want for parents, for the workers who work with those children. If you value your children, you value the people who are supporting you and doing your parenting. I mean, it's a bigger cultural question as well. But as minister, I have a responsibility. And you know, I, I know it is very difficult at the moment in terms of uh, the cutbacks to funding. And to give you an example, in one of my areas alone in the HSE, the budget was overdrawn by 39, 32 million. 32 million. I mean, think about that. One, one region, 32 million because of the demands of, for example, secure care for, for older children, which are costing a fortune in this country. Um, and I could go on, I won't, you know, I won't go into all the details with you, you know, but my own budget in the department had to go back by 72 million. I mean, the country is broke, and we have to try and get it to a situation where we can manage the debt again. And that's why, 
you know, the kind of, you know, as you say, maybe staff losing their jobs. I certainly don't want to see that. I, I understand that, Minister, and I, I absolutely applaud the fact that you want to do this. Yeah. I applaud the fact that you are working for this. I just know, as you will know, that when the Child Care Act was um, enacted, it took a long time because of finances to, to implement uh, yeah. parts of it. And I, 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 it's, it's, this is not a criticism. It's I am just wondering, in this financial climate that yes. we have, the task that you're taking on has to be done one way or the other. But just how do you, how do you really feel you can do it? I'm not saying you can't, because I am fascinated to think that you can. And, and, and I, I, I think who does, if you can? What, do you, what's the, what, what did you say at the how, end there? How, 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 can do you feel? How, how do you think you're going, how do you feel you're going to actually achieve what needs to be met yes. in the current climate because it's such a, yeah. an Everest-like yes. um, quest? Well, I mean, I think the answer is that it's extremely difficult. And I, I, I'm not sure at times of the country, you know, that in terms of the financial pressures that are there, uh, they are enormous. Now, we could go into debates about, you know, Anglo and debt and bondholders and all of the rest of it, and that would be, you know, that, that's legitimate. But obviously the government's taking a certain line to try and get back so that we can, you know, borrow on the markets again and get the economy moving. Um, I mean, the most important thing is to get the economy moving, to have confidence internationally and nationally. Once the economy starts moving, then the kind of question that you're raising, um, the confidence is back and, and the money flows again and, the, you know, the taxes, you know, the priorities can be re-established. I mean, from my point of view, what I'd say to you is that, first of all, the fact that I'm at Cabinet, that there is a voice trying to protect the sector is important. I would ask you in return, I would say to you, that you need to have your voices heard. Um, I think there's a challenge for all of you, locally, nationally, to make sure that people know about the work you're doing, about the challenges of it, um, you know, about the importance of it. Uh, there's going to be a children's referendum later this year. I think you all need to have a voice around that if you believe uh, that the best interests of children should be in our constitution that the voice of the child should be heard, that a child should have rights in its own right. Um, you have an opportunity. By doing that, I think you're giving a greater value to the work that you do with children, and you're, you're highlighting what we need to highlight. Because again, I go back to, to the history. The history is that children have been behind closed doors, that injustices have taken place. We've moved now to a situation where there's, there's great quality in terms of you know, what you want to provide for children, what is being provided. And so there is a, you know, there's an ongoing job at a national level, but I accept my responsibility and I've met with you know, your professional representatives and the union side, the professional side. And you know, I'm always open to hearing what people have to say and trying to reflect that in terms of decisions. But um, I, I will just say again, you know, the financial situation is just so tough that there's very tough decisions having to be taken, you know, and try and protect the front line as much as possible. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, where's Wayne? There you go. Okay, um, Wayne has a question for you again. It kind of follows on a little bit from what Deirdre was just saying about some of the challenges that you, yes. you currently face. Off you go, Wayne. Um, does your experience as a social worker affect you personally when you have to make cuts in areas that you know will end up hurting families or have a negative impact on them? Does your experience as a social worker or a therapist affect you when you have to make cuts that you know will hurt or even break promises that might have a negative impact on families? Does it, does well, it look, cause you problems? Of course it does. Yeah. I mean, of course it does. Nobody, nobody in government, and it's nothing, you know, being a social worker is just, you know, part of, it is a very important part of who I am and has, you know, influenced my, you know, my experience and my decision making. But, you know, for every member of government, I would say, you know, in every department, if you take every department, you know, obviously, um, when it comes to children and families, and, you know, you look at the budget in, in uh, social welfare, and you look at the kind of decisions that Joan Burton's had to take, with a budget, I think, of um, 13 billion, and you look at James Riley with a budget of 16 billion, and you say you have to, you have to get efficiencies. Of course it's difficult, but I would say to you, one of the things we have to do, and it's never popular when you say this, we have to do things better. We have to be more efficient. There has been waste. I bet if I asked, if I went through every single person here today, I bet you could give me examples of how you'd like to see things done more efficiently. So at a national level, we have to do things better. We have to reform the health service so we're not wasting money. 
Um, we do have more young people. We do have a growing population. You know, we have more young people. Uh, so we do need resources to, to deal. And I got an extra, um, I think it was 17 million this year, so that I could keep the ECCE scheme and deal with the, the, the greater population who need it um, in the coming year. So, you know, the government gave me that extra 17 million to make sure I kept that scheme. So, of course, you don't want to make cuts, but what you try and do is I tried to preserve that scheme to make sure that that didn't go um, or, or get cut back. You know, there were some changes, but that it didn't get cut back. But they're not easy decisions. You know, when I look at youth funding, when I look at the early childhood schemes, uh, when I look at adoption and fostering, I mean, some people would say to me, well, why would you support inter-country adoption when there's so many issues in, in, you know, it, within Ireland and child protection? Well, if you're a couple out there who want to you know, adopt a child from another country, you want the minister dealing with the issues in relation to Vietnam or Russia or wherever you want to adopt from. And yet I have to balance the priorities around that and say, do I cut back in that area and put more money into child protection? They're the kind of decisions, you know, in my area that I have to make. And then ministers in other areas, you know, in health, there's really tough decisions. But you have to reform how you deliver services as well so that they, you know, you're getting more for less and, and you get more efficiencies. Um, that's important too. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Um, somebody just let me know what time it is. I'm just mindful. Quarter past. Excellent. Okay, so we've got time for maybe another three questions, possibly. Where's Patrick? Patrick here? Yeah. There you are. There you go. Okay, so we need a microphone up the front here. Thank you. Um, Patrick has a question for you on men working in childcare. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, Denmark has the highest percentage of uh, male childcare workers in Europe, according to the Men in Ch Childcare Conference held in Edinburgh in 2009. And uh, Ireland has lost at less than 1%. Uh, Minister, do you think men have a role to play in childcare? And what plans has your government to improve this clearly unbalanced situation? Yeah. Okay, Denmark has the highest ranking percentage of male childcare workers in Europe. Ireland has the lowest. And Patrick is just wondering, you know, do you feel that men have a role to play in childcare and how can we get more of them into it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was in Norway two weeks ago at a conference on early childhood care and I went to see some fantastic um, early, uh, early care centres. And it really struck me, the centre I went, went to, one of the ones I went to, which was fantastic, had 50% of men there. And it was terrific to see it, I have to say. It was kind of a different atmosphere. And I had a long chat with the, the leader in the centre, was, was, was a guy, and uh, he was chatting to me about the difference. They, it was a private facility, but funded by government, because all, all, um, you know, all services in Norway are, get very heavy government subsidy for, for children. It's a terrific service there. By the way, it was minus, what was it, minus, minus nine, and all of the children were playing outside. <laughs> And they were spending several hours a day. And I was thinking, if we had the right clothes for the rain here, we could do a lot more outside. But they, I was saying to them, yeah, the kid's not frozen. You know, they were sort of absolutely they were out playing in the snow and would be out for several hours um, every day with minus nine. It's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting kind of choice, you know. Um, but I, it was, I really thought, it, I, I think it's a very good idea to, to, to see men working in childcare. And... Um, I'm not quite sure if there's any specific initiatives. You probably know more about that chain than I do just there, right there, now. There actually isn't, because we were discussing it myself yeah. and Mary Cooper's oh. around there somewhere. Some experts down here. Okay. Go on, what's right. happening? Good to hear.
Well, that would Sounds be very, and you could get to Hawaii as well. So. <laughs> it would be great, really great, great to see how that, um, how that causes changes yeah, in that area. I, mean, I, I think it's really important, and I do think, uh, as you were saying, uh, there's probably some ambivalence about parents, but the minute you see it, like, it's, it's just about doing it, I think, and, and, and getting, getting men in there working with, with women. Great, thank like you, Patrick. More. Where's Ashley? There she is. Ashley, just up the front here. Great, thank you. Ashley has a question on Hi, um, sentencing. Uh, why does the Irish judicial system seem to have such a lax, a lax approach to the sentencing of uh, child sex offenders? Why does the Irish judicial system seem to have such a lax approach to the se sentencing of child sex offenders? Um, there was a, a story, I think it was on the front page of today's examiner, yeah. um, that 80% of the sex offenders that are going to be leaving our prisons in the next 12 months 80% of them have received no um, psychological intervention or treatment whatsoever during their time in prison. Um, so why, why, why do you think we seem to have such a lax approach? Because if you compare it to international... To sentencing. To sentencing, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, who makes, who does the sentencing? Um, it's, it's judges. Um, obviously, you have, uh, you know, uh, the judiciary are separate to the, to the you know, to, to government. Uh, you have to respect their independence. Um, having said that, um, I think there are real issues about this. It's probably not so much lax, as you say, it's maybe lax, but it's, it's inconsistent. And um, I suppose the sentence you give uh, to a crime, what determines that sentence? It's how seriously you take that crime. And if you take rape or you take child sexual abuse, um, it's taken many years for us to get the proper approach to sentencing. Uh, to those crimes, in fact, to even get them. We still don't get enough crimes of rape even being heard in the courts. So um, this is about um, attitude, about the seriousness with which you take a crime. I think it's about judges' training and understanding the impact uh, that child sexual abuse has. I think in this country we have been more inclined to punish people for crimes against property than against people. And I think we have to change that. I think we have to... We have to take these crimes. They destroy people's lives. And uh, we, have to, we have to take a, a more consistent, we have to see a more consistent and uh, very serious approach. I mean, I think there is better understanding now of the impact of these crimes. Uh, but again, you see amazing inconsistencies in sentencing. Thank you very much. Uh, Lemia? Where's Lemia? There she is. Okay, Lemia has a question for you on... Youth homelessness. Yeah. What are your efforts? Are you what efforts are you making to address youth homelessness? What efforts are you or your department making to address youth homelessness as an issue? Well, I mean, this uh, some of the figures that we have, and there's inconsistency in the figures. But some of the figures I'm being given are, are telling me uh, that there is a reduction in youth homelessness. But we know that there are big issues around housing in the country at the moment and access to housing. Um, yes, there has been a 10-year strategy around homelessness. What I'm doing at the moment is I'm reviewing that. Um, I have a, an organization that's um, involved with uh, very carefully examining what's worked well in the strategy that we've had over the last 10 years and where do we need to go now. Uh, one of the things, for example, in terms of homelessness, it, well, it's not quite, it's slightly associated with it, is that young people who are coming into the country now unaccompanied, who were a very vulnerable group before, they're no longer going into hostels, they're now going into foster care. And that's a huge improvement in the situation a few years ago when I did a study myself on these unaccompanied young children. I think they are being protected a bit more. And do you think that will reduce the number of these kids that just seem to be disappearing? Because we had a... Yes, it yeah. has reduced it. Right, great. Yes, it has great. reduced it. I mean, the hostels were not suitable. Um, the foster care is a much better alternative for these yeah. young people. Um, but we do need to examine the current situation. I, I met Focus Point recently. In fact, I'm meeting them later this afternoon uh, to open a new facility here, here in Waterford. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a serious issue because it, it do, it's very connected, of course, with alcohol and drugs. And I won't say one thing, and it's a very young audience here. I'm really concerned uh, about the kind of statistics I'm getting about young people and alcohol. Um, we're drinking more. We're drinking earlier. Um, we've more serious, it's only one person agreeing with me here, is there? No. <laughs> um, you know, we have more serious issues than other countries in relation to alcohol. 
Yeah. Um, we're seeing more young people coming into care are, uh, whose parents are alcoholic or drug addicted. We're seeing children under five coming into care because of addiction issues. And I think, I mean, personally, the whole sports sponsorship issue is an interesting one. Um, there's a debate at the moment about, I believe we should take um, alcohol advertising out of sport. That's my own view. I think we should work towards it. I know the organizations can't work overnight on it, you know, can't work without sports sponsorship uh, from the alcohol industry, perhaps overnight. But I believe the message that young people are getting at every sport event, you know, at every festival uh, linked to alcohol, I think it leads to an acceptance uh, that is clearly damaging, uh, you know, individuals and families. And my own view would be we have to work to change that, as indeed they've done in other countries. When we took the smoking advertising away, people thought that, you know, lots of things wouldn't survive, but they've all survived, Shane, you know, and they Absolutely. get sponsorship elsewhere. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take two more questions, okay? So, Ruth, wherever you are, prepare yourself. You're coming, no, I'm going to come to you last. Um, Martina <laughs> Devine? Someone get a microphone to Martina there, please, Frank? Um, Martina actually has a question for you on the Children's Rights Bill. Yeah. So, um, um, Minister, you announced that the referendum on children's rights would take place this year. Why do you think such an important <coughs> event took so long to come about? Well, I'm only minister since March, and if I have the referendum, which I fully intend to do this year, I think that would be a good delivery from me and from the government. Um, why has it taken so long? I, I think people are nervous about changing the constitution in this country. I think some people are nervous that if you give rights to children, you're taking rights from parents. I don't believe that that's the case. I think if you give rights to children, you're strengthening the family, you're strengthening parents. Um, I believe that there's just been you know, it's been complicated getting the wording right, so I think there's some genuine hard work to be done on it, that there's been different views on it. You know, we've had, uh, first of all, we had Bertie Hearn saying we'd have it, then you had Brian Lenehan coming up with the wording, uh, then you had the committee that came up with another wording, then you had Barry Andrews coming up with a different wording, and now you have a new government, and we're going to have a wording on it. So it is complicated. You know, when I, I, you know, I'm no constitutional lawyer, but when I started examining it a few months ago, just looking at how you know, different parts of the Constitution interact with one another, if you change one part, it impacts on another. You've got to have respect for the rights of parents, while at the same time building in rights for children. So there's balances. And you know, in the Constitution, I'm sure you've been studying different parts of it, but if you take a word like, for example, the committee recommended cherish all the ch children of the state equally, that might make a lot of common sense to everybody in this, in this hall, but when you start looking at it from a constitutional point of view and you say, well, what does cherish actually mean? What's it going to mean when it's interpreted in the courts? It becomes a different thing. So one of the reasons it is actually genuinely complex to change the constitution and people are nervous about doing it. And I mean, I hope all of you are going to be helping me to ensure that when I, we put a children's rights referendum, that you will be advocates, as people who work in the sector, that you will go out there and fight to make sure that this referendum is understood and that it gets passed and that it's not you know, taken over by groups who want to say it's something that it's not. So I hope, you know, in the months ahead when we have the referendum that you all will, hope you'll have a meeting in this room discussing the referendum, making sure that people in Waterford understand that you and your families can all be big advocates for this because you're working in the area, you know how important it is and I would really appeal to each and every one of you in this room today to help us make sure, because this could be a turning point on some of the issues we've been discussing here today. This is a turning point in relation to children's rights in this country. If we can put into the Constitution, as they've done in other countries, that children matter and children's voices should be heard and their best interests considered. Have we had a habit, do you think, oh, you know, in recent years, despite all of the scandals and various things that we've had, of putting the needs and welfare of children a little bit on the back burner, that let's do something else first? Yeah. I mean, I remember discussing the, the, the rights referendum about four years ago with, on Vincent Brown's program, and Geoffrey Shannon and a few other people were there, and there was huge disagreement, as you say, about tiny minutiae, right. it just didn't seem yeah. to be 
relevant and you know well, you know you don't want it to be hijacked by constitutional yeah. lawyers mm. you know this you know the constitution of course it's legal and it's very important but you know this is a broader debate chain as you say and uh, we've got to make sure these things are important and i think something we need to do as a sector as well and, and you need to think about are the economics of what you do we tend not to talk about economics and children but at this conference I was at in Norway recently, it was really interesting to hear world-class economists saying, we've got to talk about the economics of early childhood intervention. In other words, if we do the right thing by children when they're three years of age, you're reducing antisocial behavior, you're reducing crime, you're, you're reducing addiction, you get better outcomes for employment, better jobs, just by three hours a day, five days a week for three-year-old children. That's what the research is telling us about what you do. So we've got to, in Ireland, we've got to make that economic case as well to get greater priority because, you know, the, the debate is so economic at the moment. It's very hard to get space to discuss the kind of issues we're discussing here yeah. today at a national level. Okay, last word of the day goes to Orl, uh, Ruth. Sorry, Ruth, last question. What do you think the future holds for newly qualified social care workers in terms of salary and employment prospects? What do you think the future holds for newly qualified social care workers? I'm going to throw childcare workers into that as well. Yes. In terms of salary and employment, are we looking, do you think, at a long term? Do you think we're looking at a good future, a healthy future for students qualifying? And if you think about the fact that there's going to be students graduating from courses all over the country into these areas, do we have, do you think, a positive future? For of course them? you do. Um, but what I would say to you is that it's linked. Uh, to the future of our economy as well, because every sector is linked to getting the economy right. And that's why having the right economic policies, you know, getting back into the markets that everybody knows about now, managing the debt and getting a focus back onto job creation. That's going to be the context for you uh, getting the kind of work that you want. It's going to be the context for you um, having a, a good career and good career opportunities. I would say that we have to have a relentless focus on training and standards and you know, higher and higher standards in, in all our work with children. Um, but I think the courses around the country are offering that more and more. And um, I, we have a growing population. We have a, we have a big birth rate in Ireland, unlike Hungary and other, or other uh, countries you know, where there is not the young population that we have. And I think the more focus we get on to quality and the kind of point I've been making about the economics of early childhood intervention, how good it is for children, how good it is for a society, that's all going to support the kind of work that you're doing and you know, in increase the opportunities that you have. And I just want to take this opportunity to, to wish you the very best, uh, to thank you for all the work and the study that you're doing, and in indeed to the staff who, who give you so much opportunity uh, and for being here today. Thank you very much, Minister. OK. Um, this has been the last lecture of the lecture series for this year. Before you run away, sit for a minute. I want to thank all of you for coming along all, every time, being so attentive. I want to thank my own group and the community development class in particular who've helped us out right through the year with organizing things. I want to thank Zara and Beat FM for helping us to promote it and make it a huge success. I particularly want to thank Deirdre Wickham who has been absolutely pivotal in getting the thing on a whole other level this year. Um, I want to thank... Damien and Will and all the journalism and, and sound engineering crowd. Uh, Jared down the back, who has really been a major feature of the talks this year. Um, just everybody, Mick and the school and everyone else, all the teachers have been involved. Um, thank you so much. And of course, to all of our speakers, the minister again, thank you. And lads, I'm sorry, with the time constraints today, I didn't get around to all the questions. I'm really sorry. I would have loved to have gotten to everybody. But thanks for all the thought you put into them. Thank you.